Hi, my name's Ian Turner and I'm from the University of Derby. So today I'm going to give you a brief overview of remote laboratory provision. And my information is drawn from both the past, what universities did in the immediate advent of the COVID crisis to deliver laboratories remotely, and some of the suggestions that people are making about what they're going to be doing going forwards. So one thing that is really consistent in all responses the sector's made is that both practical work and in some disciplines field work are absolutely fundamental parts of the subject's pedagogy. They are the thing that defines the subject, they are the thing that attracts people to the subject and the thing that allows students to be successful in research or careers going forward. There's also strong agreement that you can't ultimately replace that practical experience. The students will need to have it in some cases. And that's something I personally agree with. But there's also a clear recognition that in the situation we currently find ourselves in, that something needs to change. We need to think about the best approaches for our practicals to allow students to still be successful in their uh, degree programmes. I think it's useful to begin our discussion about approaches going forward by looking at the Open University. So the Open University would probably be regarded by many as the leader in online education. Um, and when we take a look at their science programmes, of which they have many, which are really successful, it's quite interesting how they deal with practical experiences. So many of the approaches they take are the ways that the sector reacted initially and in fact the ways the sector are going to um, uh, tackle this going forward as the restrictions on laboratory access uh, remain in place. So that gives me reassurances for the things we're going to talk about in the rest of this presentation that we're mirroring the best practice the Open University uh, have developed over many years. What is also interesting is that the Open University, the world leader in online online education still has modules that require practical workshops. Now these are often blocked into summer uh, recesses and such things but they have these discrete blocks where you can go and do practical work. So even the academics there and the students on those programs recognise that that practical experience, the hands-on part of it, is fundamental to the discipline. Another approach that they take is they um, sell or provide um, small practical kits like the one you can see here on the slides that way, um, which students can then undertake simple experiments at home, often as part of you know, a synchronous or an asynchronous activity. So my final slide before we get into some of the ways that the sector reacted and perhaps some of the solutions that we have going forward is to ask the very important question what is the purpose of a laboratory so what you can see on this slide that way this slide here are five reasons drawn from the literature um, which are um, attempting to show the, the different reasons that we undertake a practical experience so let's just go through them briefly. The first one is to teach the principles of scientific inquiry, you know, develop the scientific method, test hypotheses, and those kind of factors. The second is to improve understanding of theory through practical experience, sometimes coined as linking theory to practice. You know, got the theory, got the practical element, and the, the when you practically uh, undertake the experiment, it helps understand and contextualise that theory and see it in, in action. To teach specific practical skills. So, I mean, this could be as detailed as practical techniques like microscopy, but more generally, the skills that we would see uh, value in all our sciences, like the ability to measure accurately, the ability to observe phenomenon and those kind of things. To support the development of employability, so the more generic employability skills such as team working, many labs are done in groups and pairs, problem solving, learning through failure and all those kind of aspects. And finally, to motivate and engage the learner in the subject. For many, the practical elements or the fieldwork elements are the iconic parts of the programme, the 
parts that people really enjoy, probably because a mixture of those four other reasons that I've already listed. And the reasons to consider what is the purpose of the laboratory is when it comes to making decisions about your own practicals, we may have to reflect on what the purpose of your specific laboratory is, for, you know, what you are aiming to deliver for the students. Um, I mean, it could well be that it's a mixture of all five of those, but if there's any need to rationalise or condense or combine laboratories, then understanding what the purpose of every laboratory is may help that process in some way. So what are the solutions that the sector proposed and the ones that universities like the OU currently use? So this little graphic here is my own interpretation of that and I've literally just divided them into four categories. So the use of video, the use of animation, the use of data sets and the use of simulation. And simulation can really be anything from a, a small micro simulation to a full simulation of a lab experience. So what I'm going to do now is kind of go through each of these, uh, combine some of them and just talk about some of the ways that they are used and signpost you just to use to some examples of um, resources out there which demonstrate each of these principles and at the very end i have uh, a list of places where you can go to search out materials which are all already available under all of these categories so let's start with videos animations and what i'm calling here micro simulations so micro simulations, I mean, small simulations, I'm not defining a time, but, you know, for a, you know, a small part of a laboratory experience. So these bubble diagrams, this way, that way, these bubble diagrams um, highlight all the ways I've seen uh, bioscientists across the sector um, use videos, animations or micro simulations in their laboratory experience. So in terms of pre-lab, um, I've seen them used to show the setup of equipment or apparatus. I've seen them to explain the health and safety principles of a laboratory. Now, often these are used before a physical lab, you know, to so make sure students understand the information, often linked to a quiz. But I mean, if the health and safety requirements of a practical is one of the purposes of it, then it could be used for a video as well. Um, to explain the context or the aim of the laboratory, what's the purpose, what we're trying to achieve, give that context to students before they enter the laboratory. And, and sometimes with something I'm calling here theory bridges. So a video to link the material delivered in a seminar, lecture or tutorial to the practical class, showing how the concepts relate, what concepts you're trying to test. So a theory bridge. Um, so during the lab, so for videos, animations, micro simulations that are used to replace the actual laboratory experience itself. So I think, first of all, everything I've already said in the pre-lab can be done as part of the laboratory experience, you know, kind of live on the bench. Two of the kind of really common ones would be an actual kind of run through of the practical itself. Um, so these are done in two ways that I've seen. The first one is a uh, kind of a third person run through. So someone standing with a camera filming somebody else who's undertaking the experiments and then they're either turning around to the camera and explaining what's happening or it's done with a voiceover afterwards. So you're seeing the practical experience um, um, from video. The other way, which is a solo way, is the point of view, which is the POV on there, where you've got a camera, maybe a you know GoPro camera or something similar strapped to your chest, and you're actually filming yourself undertaking the experiment. Often you can see the experimenter's hands in there explaining what, what they're going to do. Um, the point of view one, um, obviously, is easier to set up because you don't need to have um, an additional person filming you. Uh, and when we get to solutions going forward, I mean, point of view experiments may be something that people desire to do to get into the laboratory um, uh, and, and actually um, film the experiments. 
ahead of trying to get students in to take the experiments themselves. Um, there's a lot of people use what they call simulated practicals. So this is where you ultimately provide the students with some data set, but there's some small animation or simulation that allows you to take a part of the experiment. Uh, and a good example would be something like a titration where you've got a, an animation or a simulation of a titration apparatus and the student can interact and change the levels in some way before they get a result or data set which they can then manipulate and undertake calculations of. And the final one is what I'm calling here uh, splits. So basically breaking the practical up into its constituent parts. It's done in all sorts of ways. Um, a series of short videos explaining different parts of the practical. Uh, videos to replace parts of the practical, particularly those things in long time intervals. Splits a way to explain what's going on in a piece of machine or a piece of apparatus. Splits back to the theory to explain what's just undertaken in the practical um, segment. So short pieces of video or animation that split away from the practical experience. And often these approaches you see here are used in combination with each other to, to create a package which as best as possible recreates the experience a student would face to, in um, the laboratory. So what this slide has got here is a series of animation stroke mic micro simulation examples. So you'll notice that on this slide and subsequent ones, there's uh, four QR codes. So if you're watching this on YouTube, if you pause the video and hover a smartphone with a camera on it over it, open up the camera, hover it over it, and it'll automatically open up the website for you. If you prefer not to do that, just download the slides and I'll put the URLs for each of these links um, but beneath the slides. Um, uh, so I advise you to pause the recording now and take a quick look at all of these and then I'll just say a word about them. OK, so this is just a sample of some of the animation stroke micro simulations are out, out there. So we've got a virtual PCR simulator, which allows you to manipulate the, um, the, the PCR machine, which has got some very simple animations embedded into it. We've got another example of McKaylee's Menton kinetics equation. So this is kind of got no, no graphics in, but allows you to manipulate the values in order to generate data. We've got um, some really nice images from the University of Dundee of um, uh, anatomy and physiology, three dimensional uh, uh, bones and things that you can rotate and view or with detail. And then we've got a virtual histology laboratory. And for each of these slides, you can click on them uh, and bring up a microscope image, which you can then change through the range of optical magnifications. And they're all labeled um, incredibly in depth and detailed resources. So though the visual appeal of some of the animations and micro simulations uh, that are on here and others that you may have seen yourself do vary massively. There's an incredible amount of depth and quality available in some of these resources. Looking at the histology guide, for example, though they wouldn't allow a student to actually focus a microscope and calibrate it themselves, the images they produce would allow many of the other aspects such as drawing and labeling and interpretation of structures still to take place if, if the lesson plan was structured in the right way. And I'll say a word more about how you use these resources as we get towards the end of the session. This slide has got uh, videos, examples on it. Once again, just, just three. Um, so just like before, Pause the recording to watch them. Um, URLs beneath the bottom, QR codes are on the right hand side of the slides. So I've got three examples here, all very different. So the University of Sheffield uh, example comes from uh, a massive repository of dissection videos produced in medicine students, uh, all searchable and taggable. All the videos are short in terms of uh, time frame. Um, and this one's shown the, you know, the dissection of part of the foot. The foot. Uh, example number two is kind of a, 
a hybrid between a simulation and a video. So it, here it's a simulation of a titration experiment with short videos explaining the principles of a titration, how to actually do it, followed by some simulation where the students can manipulate the computer graphics to um, export all the values. Uh, and then the final video from Nigel France of Swansea is explaining some of the theoretical components that would normally undertake in the lab to support a laboratory experience. So they're all very different. Uh, and I, I see in the sector four broad kind of areas where people um, produce videos. One is practical explanations, explaining the, the topics, explaining how the theory links to them, explaining what you're going to be doing in the, the practicals. I see videos of actual experiments themselves, which are the point of view or the third person ones I mentioned before. So that's a whole practical experience. Video techniques, so explaining how to do a particular technique, how to use a micro pipette, how to load an HPLC, video technique videos. Um, uh, and then the first one, a kind of visual theory. So trying to help people understand and link that theory to the practical experience. The visual theory ones are often used as part of the normal lecture seminar tutorial experience as well, but can be incorporated into the practical envi in environment. Um, so there's some examples here and we'll talk more about where you can find your own examples afterwards as well. My next set of examples are repositories, uh, and there are loads of these at the moment. The sector is working well to share such repositories. So once again, three examples with QR codes and, and web links at, at, at the bottom. Um, so top left, we've got uh, GIS geography. It's got, it's got seven um, environmental data sources where you can download masses of loads of data around to climate change and other such situations. We've got um, r3data.org, which is a, a, a database of databases. You know, it's originally a research data repositories, or which are freely accessible and searchable. And then an example of a really specific database, which one has to be on iron channel drugs. And you can already see from the slide that there's different types of databases used, very general ones, um, databases of databases like r 3 data thematic databases, you know, anatomy of fizz, for example, and then specific databases such as the iron channel drugs one. So a lot of people use these databases to draw down data sets, which they can then use for to simulate the data which would be generated in a practical for their students. Or they give students effectively a live brief to develop, you know, trying to play on the scientific inquiry elements to actually explore, develop a hypothesis and explore these databases in some in some way. The next category is simulations. So here I'm not talking about micro simulations, I'm talking about big simulation packages. And the three examples I've got on here, particularly Labster and Learning Science, are commercial companies which produce resources for industry and the higher education sector all over the world um, to use simulation to replace or supplement the practical experience. So if we're talking about holistic um, investment and replacement of practical experiences, this could be a good option for people. So it's definitely worth pausing the recording here and go into the websites of these different companies just to get a feel for them. They all have a slightly different modus operandi, a different approach. Um, so I recommend you do that now. So the example I'd like to use to talk about simulation is Labster. So this slide contains a short video, one minute, 36 seconds from Labster, um, and it's their promotional video. Now, I think it's probably worth watching this just to get a sense of what these simulations look like, particularly for those of you who haven't seen any kind of online simulations in recent times. I think you'd be quite surprised and impressed at the quality of the graphics. Now, the YouTube video won't work um, within this, the tool I'm using here, so you need to pause the recording, either go to the link which I put on the slide this time or zap the QR code just to watch that video, then please return to the presentation. So that's a brief introduction to Labster. 
So I don't work for Labster, I've got no commercial interest in Labster, I'm just using them as an example of, of sim simulations. So what you can see here on the left is just some uh, images from their own uh, learning package, just highlights the range of courses that they offer. So there's 18 overall courses, but within that there's thousands of what I've been called in micro simulations of individual elements. Uh, and as you can see from the top graphic, there's all sorts of um, interactive features such as quizzes and animations and things that students uh, can access as part of these packages. You can also see on the right just two examples of the specialist offer they make for certain types of bioscience provisions, so microbiology and physiology. So as part of a, a group that we're involved in, which presumably you're watching this video from Dry Labs Real Science, we did have a full presentation by Labster on, on their products. Um, it's a 25 minute presentation, but if you're interested in these kind of simulations and, uh, and you want to understand a bit more about how they work, I'd recommend that you watch that. Uh, and there's a link to the YouTube video where that's pr produced on the right. Um, on the other side, you can see a link to some resources which Labster provided to us about how to get started at Labster and some of the common questions they ask. Of course, there's two big statements to make here. The first one is that many of the resources I've shown you so far, in fact, all of them are free. These are publicly open free resources. Labster, Learning Science and the others are not free. These are commercial companies. They design a high quality product and it costs um, and that needs to be factored in. But um, those institutions that use it and there are many worldwide, including several in the UK, um, use it as part of a complete package across multiple modules, in fact, the whole program. Speaking to those people who use simulations, um, uh, always positive things to say, but a recommendation is always that one or a very few individuals have ownership of the simulation packages and decide which simulations are used where and how much to make sure the students get the most from it and there's no repeats and the novelty of using the simulations to supplement the practical experience when it's available is still present. You did just see a nod in the trailer to using simulations to uh, replace practical experiences or supplement practical experiences uh, and talked about some research. So this is from the Labs' own page, but you can see here just by the one I've highlighted um, which was in Nature Biotechnology, that they have built their company on doing research to judge the effectiveness of simulations alongside their work. Uh, and it's well worth specifically reading this paper to reassure any of you who feel that you can never replace the practical experience with a simulation. We start from the outset saying that's not our ultimate aim here. But simulation alongside a practical can actually enhance student experience. So if you invest in something like a simulation package and continue it on pre post COVID, then actually we could be enhancing the student experience. So this is my final slide. So all I've tried to do here is show some of the ways that the sector have responded, you know, through the videos, animations, micro simulations and large simulations. There's no rocket science in here. Most people are using all of those things in combination to cover the various aspects of practical, practical skills. And many hope to supplement that with some physical practical experience in the short or immediate term. So when preparing your practicals, I urge you to go back to the practical learning outcomes and think about those questions I asked you at the beginning. What is the purpose of this practical? What am I trying to replicate? And then breaking that down and thinking about how each element of that could be supplemented by one of the types of resources I've just mentioned before. Um, then once you've done that, it's a look to see what resources are available to support those kind of activities. So as well as the ones I've already mentioned, on this slide here, you can see a link to some big collections of data. So the, the, what, the first one, a collection of large publicly available data sets and the one on the right, collection of large science and STEM resources. These have these got lots and lots of examples, 300 plus you can see there, ranging from across all the science and STEM disciplines. 
the quality it, it is very variable, but I'm confident there'll be something in there for everybody to support their work. And if you can't find the thing that you need, I mean, this is where the sector can play a part because many of us have our own in-house video collections to support our practicals. Not for every practical, for some. If we're able to share those in some way, that means that we'd have a much bigger pool of resources that we could draw from. And my final thought is, as many of us think about ways to get students into the laboratory to undertake those experiments, which we don't feel could be replicated by any of the techniques before, is that it may be more sensible, at least in the short term, to not try and get the students back, but to get an academic or a member of technical staff back into the laboratory to produce a video or an animation of the practical. So if something exists, perhaps getting someone back into to create that resource may be uh, better in terms of all aspects, cost, resource, safety, than trying to get the students back to do that experience. So I hope you found this useful. Visit the links. Any questions, happy to take them. Uh, offline. Thanks.